SLT Mobitel The Connection Nimma vishesha sunlight nishpadana milade gena Sri Lanka ya manudam diyamana api savimak karama sunlight kya night no contest the port city bill third reading passes in parliament with a 91 vote majority after a heated debate between the government and opposition they are saying that they are willing to transfer 51% of the shares they use good concepts to compromise strategic position in order to give an advantage to china staying positive national operations center member offers vaccination hopes we will roll out the vaccination program and the target is over 60% it will happen within the next 6 months while uk expert outlines his formula for beating the virus all the vaccines appear to be effective against all the variants we know about so far at keeping people out of hospital and lowering the mortality rate economic partnership president gotabaya explains his strategy for balancing india and china while we are aware of and regional power dynamics we consider india our closest neighbor and we understand their security concerns the signs are good the central bank keeps its accommodative monetary policy stance while expressing recovery confidence the impact of the third wave will be somewhat less severe than the effects of the first and the second wave all this and much more coming up on this thursday the 20th of may 2021 This is Other Than Our First at Nine, live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Shanella Fernando in your top stories for tonight. The Colombo Port City Economic Commission bill was passed with amendments in Parliament today by a majority of 91 votes. All political parties affiliated with the government supported the bill during the vote, while members of Samagi Jana Balavegya, Jatika Jana Balavegya, and the Tamil National Alliance voted against. However, accusations continued to be hurled at both the government and the opposition during today's debate, during which Ahila Ilange Tamilar Sikachi parliamentarian Gajendra Kumar. Arpon Nambalam charged the government for compromising the country's geopolitically strategic location in China's favor. The Colombo Port City Economic Commission bill was debated for a second day today. The Supreme Court on Tuesday determined that the bill requires amendments consistent with the country's constitution and ruled that the bill should be passed by a simple majority in parliament. महानगरह बस्नायर संवर्धन अमात्यांशे लेखं तुमा विसिन देदास दहनमे पाश्चनी मासे हायवेनी दा नीतिपत तुमा वेतर येनल लिपिया एहिदी ओन योजना करन्ने वी विश टू नाउ ड्रो योर अटेंशन टू द इश्यूज एक्सप्लेन इन द पैराग्राफ बिलो पर्टेन इनटू द एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन ऑफ रिक्लेम लैंड इन द एरिया ऑन द बेसिस दैट दिस मिनिस्ट्री हैज कंडक्टेड विद ऑल द ऑब्जर्वेशन मेड इन योर ओपिनियन देन से इन ऑर्डर टू अटेन द पॉलिसी ऑब्जेक्टिव ऑफ क्रिएटिंग स्पेशल इकोनॉमिक जोन विद इन द रिक्लेम लैंड एरिया एनहा in ease of doing business it is important that the port city land must operate outside the authority of kalambu municipal council this is what you said not us they themselves say that it has to operate outside the kalambu municipal council they have forgotten that thereafter a key reason for the above requirement is the financial dosa that could incur and they are saying that they are willing to transfer 51% of the shares this is what it says provide for an estate management company to be incorporated with 51% of the shares to port city kalambu private limited me pawarala denna yojana karapu aya then keno rata pawala denna hadanol mona vihiluwadda our view is that uh, to think in terms of uh, special economic
economic zones or whatever name that you want to call it. Being so innovative that you need to even at times look for amendments to the constitution in order to create that space is not a wrong thing. This constitution is 73 years old. You have already made 20 amendments and the problems are increasing. This is a defunct constitution. This constitution is currently kept alive purely on emotional grounds. It doesn't make sense for you to centralize in this way. So in that sense actually the idea of a port city is not a bad thing at all. This concept of sovereignty that you want to hug on to is a defunct concept. You can't uh, want to be a part of the global economy and then want to close yourself also from it. So these are issues that have to be thought anew. If this country is to compete in an era such as this then taking drastic measures is something that ought to be welcome. Make no mistake, we are not opposing this bill for the reasons that the government officially state they are bringing this bill for. The reality is that there is no such thing as a free lunch. The reality is that the Mahindra Rajapaksa and now the Gotabaya Rajapaksa governments are China-centric. There is no running away from it. They are so China-centric that they use ideally good concepts but rather to compromise this country's geopolitical strategic position in order to give an advantage to China. Constitution of the Commission members. The Commission shall consist of five members to be appointed by the President, one of whom shall be appointed as the Director General of the Commission. The President may in his absolute discretion and without assigning any reason whatsoever thereof, by order published in the Gazette, remove any member with effect from the date of the such publication. For all that you say about the legislature and its powers, supremacy of parliament, you had given powers to make rules, even criminal laws, to punish people to that commission. And Supreme Court has ruled that out. There is an argument that uh, Honorable Kehli Rambukwala just referred to, that this does not form part of Sri Lanka's territory in terms of international law or even domestic law. Supreme Court has dealt with that. It says that so far, no court has ruled that it is outside Sri Lanka. Presumption of validity, referring to annexation of this as part of the district of Colombo, they say presumption of validity exists pending a final decision by the court. So it still is open for anybody, particularly the Chinese authorities, to claim this to be not part of Sri Lanka and this determination will assist them in that. You are enacting in your own laws when you even don't have jurisdiction over that territory but declaring it and gifting it in your territorial waters a landmass to China and you will reap the consequences of this in judicious act of yours very soon. Honorable Sumandiran in his speech said that the court has left it open on the question of whether these part of the territory of Sri Lanka, this reclaimed land. These were the court says in very clear terms. For the aforementioned reasons, court holds that the Colombo port city is part of the territory of Sri Lanka in terms of the law and parliament has legislative power over the reclaimed area. What a lie! Following today's debate, the Speaker asked the House whether a vote was required on the matter to which the main opposition, Samagi Janabalavegia, stated that a vote was not required. However, Jatika Janabalavegia parliamentarian Vijita Herath called for a vote to be held. Accordingly, the second reading of the Colombo Port City Commission Bill was passed with 148 votes in favour and 59 against. The bill was opposed by the Samagi Janabalavegia, Jatika Janabalavegia and the Tamil National Alliance. After the passing of the second reading vote, amendments as per the instructions given by the Supreme Court were introduced during the committee stage. During the committee stage, opposition MP Dr. Harsha De Silva presented several amendments to the bill which the government opposed. Accordingly, there were three votes on the proposals made by MP De Silva which were defeated in Parliament. A third reading vote was called following the committee stage, which was also passed by a majority of 91 votes. Kalagunia Gohunat, Rhino Nangwalata, Safe Tamai Mulu Gedarama. 
As Sri Lanka's daily COVID-19 cases show no sign of reduction, health experts believe that the best course of action to bring the surge under control would be to ensure that the general public remain confined to their homes for at least two weeks. State Minister of Primary Health Care, Epidemics and COVID Disease Control, Dr. Sudarshini Fernandopulle made these remarks today as Sri Lanka reported over 3,500 COVID-19 infections yesterday. She also stated that the number of unidentified COVID-19 patients in society could be three times more than the number of cases confirmed in the island yesterday. Since the beginning of the third wave in the country and the spread of the UK variant, Sri Lanka's daily COVID-19 cases have continued to rise exponentially. Yesterday, the country reported its highest ever daily COVID-19 infections in the excess of 3,500. As such, health experts estimate, however, that unidentified COVID-19 cases in society could be as much as three times this number. The <laughs> Of yesterday's 3,623 cases, the Gamba district topped the list with 761 infections, while the Kalutara district reported 493. The district of Colombo, however, recorded just 218 COVID-19 infections. This places the number of cases reported from the Western province at 1,472. Meanwhile, 275 cases were reported from Gaul, 265 from Kurunagala, and 333 from K Gaul. Further, Jaffna reported 203, Anuradhapura 139, Kandy 124, Hammathota 113, and Mathara 106. A further 661 infections were reported from 14 other districts. In addition to this, 32 COVID 19 infections were also part of yesterday's daily tally. As for today, 2,718 new novel coronavirus cases have been confirmed so far. In the meantime, Chief of the National Operations Centre for the Prevention of COVID-19, Army Commander General Shavendra Silva, instructed the public to seek immediate medical advice if anyone over the age of 55 displays symptoms of COVID-19 or respiratory issues. In other developments, the Chinese embassy in Colombo confirmed today that Sri Lanka will receive the 500,000 Sinopharm vaccine donation from China by next Tuesday. Meanwhile, the State Pharmaceutical Corporation announced a purchase of 14 million doses of the Sinopharm vaccine from its Chinese manufacturer. The Chinese embassy in Colombo confirmed that 3 million out of the 14 million purchase order will arrive in Sri Lanka by early June. In the meantime, 7,275 people were administered with the second dose of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine yesterday. As such, a total of 304,961 persons have received both jabs of the vaccine to date. In addition, the first dose of the Sinopharm vaccine was administered to 16,845 persons yesterday, placing the total at 474,685. Meanwhile, the Sputnik vaccine was administered to 17,000 people yesterday, bringing the total to 14,934 so far. Following reports of unscrupulous elements charging members of the public to ensure the administering of the vaccine doses, Dr. Hemantahera today urged the public to not fall prey to such scams as everyone is entitled to their jabs free of charge. Meanwhile, Sri Lanka's overall number of COVID-19 related deaths rose to 1,051 after 36 persons succumbed to the virus yesterday.
When we see the deaths of the COVID-19 patients in the past, we can see that majority of these deaths are among the people who are elderly, who are above 60 years of age. And also, almost all the people who are dying are having some sort of chronic diseases like diabetes mellitus, chronic heart diseases, chronic liver diseases, chronic kidney diseases, chronic lung diseases. This means that if a person is having chronic diseases or is an elderly, there is a chance of getting serious complications that might end up with a death. Because of that, these elderly people and also people having chronic diseases should be extra vigilant, should take extra care about their health. In the meantime, 1,165 COVID-19 patients recovered today, pushing overall recoveries to 123,532. As such, the number of active COVID-19 cases so far currently stand at 29,540. Member of the National Operations Center for the Prevention of COVID-19 Outbreak, Professor Atula Sumatipala, offered an official assurance that the government's plan to vaccinate 60% of Sri Lanka's population will be completed in just six months. Further senior research fellow for global health at the University of Southampton, Dr. Michael Head, stated that vaccinations remain the key to defeating the pandemic as the efficacy of current vaccines against all virus variants is raised enough for governments to fast track their programs and prevent the emergence of newer variants. The two academics stated this today in discussion with Indivarya Muwatta on our current affairs program at Hyde Park on Adhaderana 24. Deputy Director General for Education and Research at the Ministry of Health, Dr. Hemant Heirat, says that in his personal opinion, a stronger message should have been sent to the people during the pre new year period that would have highlighted the risks of a new outbreak. We never relaxed or we never informed the public that now the things are okay, you can move freely. That was not the message that we passed. We always, we continued to tell the risk and also requested the public to behave in a manner which will be conducive to reduce or prevent any kind of outbreaks of this nature. However, what we did not do was that we did not want to create any fear among the people. We did not do that and probably uh, not, I won't say that because of that, but the strength of our message would have gone to a level where the expected behaviour change would not have happened. Mm -hmm. But there can be certain falls from our side also because behaviour communication, we have been doing it. But for this disease, it right. is for the first time that we are experimenting still. Before or pre-festival time, we passed this message. But probably, I, this is my personal opinion, well, I won't say that failure, mm -hmm. but it was not as effective as we expected. In the meantime, member of the National Operations Centre for the Prevention of the COVID-19 Outbreak, Professor Atula Sumatipala says that despite the country's vaccination programme having hit a snag due to supply issues, he is confident that the government's target of 60% vaccinations will be achieved in the next six months. I, I seek an explanation on um, the current vaccination drive. Are we on course here? Yeah, of course, yes. To start with, we are lucky within one year, there are so many vaccines mm -hmm. at the very beginning, COEX facility, from to give certain number of vaccinations so mm -hmm. things went wrong mm -hmm. and again remember 52% of the vaccines were bought over by 13% of population countries even before the production now when it comes to this issue it couldn't be delivered on a red carpet there were challenges and people were panicking I am very confident that we will roll out the vaccination program and the target is over 60% that will happen within the next six uh, months and because I know the inside stories the good thing is we have got other two vaccines, particularly the Chinese vaccine and the Russian vaccine, mm -hmm. Sputnik, coming in. And it's a matter of time. So we have to be patient. Mm -hmm. And as we said, that vaccine is one of the most important strategies in combating this pandemic. But it's not the only. We have to remember, even if we vaccinate 60%, we still have to follow all the basic things. Because even vaccinated people with two doses can be infected, what the vaccine actually prevent would be the complications and death. But they can still be carriers. We are in a very serious situation, true. But even after we control this wave, you can't rule out further waves may erupt, not only in Sri Lanka, until the global population majority is vaccinated. 
Meanwhile, senior research fellow for global health at the University of Southampton, Dr. Michael Head, believes that the efficacy of current vaccines against all virus variants is reason enough for governments to fast-track global vaccinations, which he says is the only way we can prevent the emergence of new variants. The UK's had a, a very high burden of COVID-19 disease. We have a lot of deaths, well over 150,000 deaths. But right now we're in a much better position with the vaccine rollout. It's going very well here and our cases and deaths have dropped significantly over the last few months. Certainly vaccines are the key weapon that will underpin progress towards the end of the pandemic. Uh, Dr. Head, I was trying to uh, talk to you earlier about uh, the changing nature of this virus. It seems to be mutating faster than we can understand. The impact of the variant upon the vaccination does not appear to have been too great, which is good news. All the vaccines appear to be effective against all the variants we know about so far at keeping people out of hospital and lowering the mortality rate. This is a good reason to vaccinate the world as fast as possible. The more COVID-19 you have, the more likely you are to see new variants of concern emerging. And we have many approved vaccines around the world. They are all highly effective. They're actually pretty similar in terms of their levels of effectiveness, particularly the two-dose vaccines, um, where you tend to get around 70% effectiveness after one dose, and then it's over 80%, around 90% perhaps effectiveness after two doses. In terms of mixing vaccines, there are trials ongoing, actually. There's no reason why it shouldn't still be highly effective to use one vaccine for one dose and a different vaccine for the second dose. We would feel reassured if we had the data to prove that and that data will be coming in over the next few weeks. But I think if people do turn up for their second dose and it's different to the first dose, they need not to be alarmed by that. They are still likely to develop very, very good protection against this virus. Dr. Head also stated that COVID-19 will be an ever-present issue in the world even after global populations are vaccinated. However, it will never reach the serious levels seen now. Can humanity catch up to this uh, evolving uh, nature of the virus? I mean, yes, humanity will catch up with it and the, the world will conquer COVID-19 in the sense that we'll, the pandemic won't last forever. We will get over it. Um, there will still be COVID-19 circulating around the world at low levels. It might be that in the future we might need booster vaccines um, if a new variant emerges that requires it or if the immunity from the current vaccine starts to wane. We don't know how long the immunity will last from these. So COVID-19 will be an ever-present problem, but it won't be anywhere near on the scale that we're seeing at the minute. Police media spokesperson DRG Ajit Rohana once again said that constant operations will be conducted to raid private parties and gatherings which are against quarantine regulations. He also urged the public to refrain from such activities and adhere to the regulations to the letter. As police operations are underway to nab quarantine law violators, police media spokesperson DIG Ajit Rohana once again urged the public to refrain from organizing parties and gatherings. Sri Lanka police have arrested 493 suspects in connection with the offences of face mask, social distancing and the quarantine rules and regulations. In addition to that, the persons who are entering and exiting from western province have been checked at 14 entry and exit points of Western Province yesterday. 5,200 persons have been checked by the police officers who had the roadblocks and 326 persons have been sent back to their original locations whilst they were trying to cross the provincial border. Especially, we are collecting information about public gatherings, parties, especially with alcohol and drugs. The police headquarters has informed all officers in charge of police stations to conduct constant raids in respect of the quarantine issues, especially conducting parties in the night. Therefore, all the times adhere with quarantine rules and regulations. President Gotabe Rajapaksa stated today that his government will not let anyone use Sri Lanka to jeopardize India's security and that of the Indian Ocean. The head of state also said that the government will look to fast track its development aspirations by strengthening its relationship with all nations while keeping in line with its neutral foreign policy. The president made these comments today while addressing the 26th International Two-Day Conference on the Future of Asia, which kicked off in Japan today under the topic shaping the post-COVID era, Asia's role in the global recovery. Asian countries must continue to improve cooperation, resolve differences and devise a regional structural design that enables all countries to rebuild 
their economies on a sounder, more progressive and more sustainable footing. Regional groups such as ASEAN, BIMSTEC and SARC should be reinvigorated with well-crafted, practical, integrated work plans to support this. Meanwhile, responding to a question on how Sri Lanka will balance the relationship between India and China, the president had this to say. China has been a key investment partner to Sri Lanka, as have many other countries. As a developing country, Sri Lanka wishes to obtain the support of all partner nations to fast track our development aspirations and improve the livelihoods of our people. Sri Lanka is keen to further strengthen our relationship with all Asian nations and countries farther away. While we are aware of world power rivalries and regional power dynamics, our foreign policy is neutral. We consider India our closest neighbor and a long-standing friend, and we understand their security concerns and sensitivities. We will never allow anyone to use Sri Lanka to jeopardize India's security. We will work closely with India and all regional partners to ensure that the Indian Ocean remains secure for the benefit of all countries. Monetary Board at its meeting held yesterday decided to maintain the standing deposit facility rate and the standing lending facility rate of the central bank at their current levels of 4.5 and 5.5 percent respectively. Central Bank Governor Professor W.D. Lakshman added that the impact of the third wave is expected to be less severe than the first and the second waves as industries have embraced the required changes to operations successfully. Further, Professor Lakshman revealed that a host of expected foreign financing inflows in the coming months are expected to bolster the country's debt servicing abilities. Although it is too early to arrive at strong conclusion, we believe that the impact of the third wave of the pandemic on economic activities will be somewhat less severe than the effects of the first and the second waves. Three main reasons for this expectation are the selective nature of mobility restrictions during the current wave, the ongoing vaccine drive, and also the economy is getting used to the working from home culture. On the external front, the government and the central bank have continued their efforts to ensure the rationalization of import payments and increase the receipt of foreign financing inflows required to meet the debt service obligation. There are a few notable events in this respect in the recent past. The swap agreement signed with the People's Bank of China, $500 million loans received from China Development Bank, AIIB loans received by two state banks, IFC-related inflows to the financial sector and the corporate sector, framework agreement signed with Exim Bank of Korea, and funding from the ADB and the World Bank. In the period ahead, the enactment of the Colombo Port City Commission Bill, the realization of the discussions with the neighboring central banks and the Middle Eastern counterparts, the receipts of the IMF SDR allocation due to us of around $800 million will bolster Sri Lanka's external sector. With that, we wrap up tonight's edition of First at Nine. Thank you for joining. Have a good night.